Welcome to another edition of Hit The Lights podcast. I've a very special guest with me today. I have Kirsty Johnson. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Gary. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad, thank you. Dealing with the challenges that we're all facing at the moment. Um, how are you coping through this uh, unusual time? Um, I'm still relatively busy. Um, I'm not a girl that likes to sit still. Um, so I've been doing a lot of time spending a lot of time um, training people, doing a lot of online webinars, things like that keep myself busy so I'm still as busy as I was sort of six months ago. <laughs> that's that's a good thing I suppose you forget time passing uh, when you're stuck. <laughs> yeah so probably a, a good place to start for us then is mo- what we tend to do is discuss uh, people's apprenticeships how they came to kind of enter the industry but I thought it might, might be a good point to start with yourself as um, I understand I think you went into a forensic science degree after leaving school. I did. So I have a full um, BSc honours degree in forensic science, um, which I know is a little bit strange for the electrical industry. <laughs> <laughs> so wh- why why forensic science? I love to know how things work. So for me, it was the chemical composition side of forensic science that really got me involved um, with that. And that's what's translated well into the electrical industry. It's the wanting to know how things work. I love it. Kind of it. I am I am probably the atypical nerd. Yeah. So did you find you were you led yourself into making that decision into into going to university, or were you given any kind of careers advice and support leaving school? Um, I wasn't really given much support, so I came from a sort of place where not many people go to university. Um, I was the first in my family to go to university, but it was always one of them things that I've I've always wanted to know more. All the time, I've spent my whole life reading, researching different things. As I said, I am a proper nerd. Um, so university was always something I wanted to do. I always wanted to get that next step of education. Sorry, I will unmute. <laughs> 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 One of the other facing challenges is constantly talking while you're muted in, at the moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can empathise with uh, your, your story a bit. Um, so I went and did a, a law degree for about three to six months somewhere around there and I absolutely hated it and ended up jacking it in but with a with a bit of debt unfortunately what what is it that kind of going through doing forensic science what what aspects of that because I don't really know too much about what you would do in that sort of degree so what what sort of things did it cover so the majority of the things I was interested in was as I said the chemical composition of how things work so it was breaking down um illegal compounds a lot of drugs things like that and been able to have a look at them and find out which where they come from, what batch they come from. A lot of people don't realise that. I know it's completely out of our industry, but if you get 20 different batches of drugs, you can have a look at the chemical composition and find out exactly where their original origins were, um, which I always found absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I've listened to a few crime detection <laughs> programmes where, you know, they've talked about the types of roots that are growing where a body's buried and they can understand that sort of thing. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. So that that probably lends itself more, I would say, to what police work and, and crime scene investigation. Is that where you initially had intended on ending up? No, I initially intended on going into pathology. Right, OK. Um, so what's that, that specific? I, yeah, so more that specific side of it rather than the police work. Um, that would have entailed another two degrees. So I would have to then go and get a medical degree and a law degree um, to follow that through. And I was, I guess it was quite fortunate. Things sort of fell into place for me that I met my, my other half, my partner. And while I was at university and they were already in the electrical industry. And I just, I fell in love, absolutely fell in love. With the industry or, the, or your, your partner? No, <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. Um, I loved the electrical industry. So while I was still at university, still writing my dissertation, in fact, I was out at ELEC shows um, on the stand, giving out bags, just talking to contractors. I've always been a people person, so I loved the talking to contractors. And I very quickly realised there was this whole avenue of things I knew nothing about, and that, that got me excited. Okay, yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. So you started going around the ELEC shows. How did that develop into a career choice then? So that then meant that I started doing my own research, my own reading. So a lot of books, <laughs> an awful lot of books, and watching a lot of online training things. 
and I soon realised that it was it sort of captivated me the electrical industry there's so many different parts to it and I love the fact it's always learning every single day you learn a new thing every single day there's another challenge um, and it did absolutely captivate me so when I left university I went straight into the electrical field and where was that so I started work at Oboe Betterman um, which is a company probably most people won't have heard of um, but they did a little bit of surge protection so we obviously I ended up here um, but they did a lot of like cable tray and things like that as their sort of business development side of things. I'm not a very good salesperson. Um, right. <laughs> I'm too technical um, and I'm too upfront. I am not afraid to say to somebody, look, we don't do a product suitable for you or you are looking down the wrong path for your installation. This is what you should be doing. And obviously sales doesn't go that well with those sort of conversations. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can say I've faced similar um, scenarios when like being a, a contracts manager and being face to face with a client. You want to recommend your services and you want to kind of get the best out of it. But you can only do what you think is like the best engineering, the best job that you can do. And unfortunately, sometimes price might come into into their decision as well. So they end up not selecting you. So how, how did you face that then? Did, did you enter into a sales role first then? Well, as business development, I was sort of trying to introduce the company because it was a massive German company, worldwide company that had come to the UK. Um, so I sort of started was introducing the company, um, but I was much more interested in the technical of the products and the technical of the installations and the roles just didn't marry up very well, unfortunately. Right, <laughs> right okay. So you, en- you ended up moving on from them? I did. So I came to work for Surge Protection Limited, which was actually my partner's, the company that my partner was at originally. Right. Okay. By my now father-in-law. Right. Okay. Keeping it in the family. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> so how, how did you enter that business? Did you, obviously you say you enjoyed the technical more than the sales. So did they uh, put you straight to use in that sense? Yeah, so straight away, even though I was, my job was sales, um, I was an area manager, but because it was only a small family company, my sales role as it was incorporated everything technical, it was anything going on in my region. So straight away when I was looking at specs, I was dealing with contractors, dealing with their sites, out on site visits. It was, it married the two up very, very well. And I very soon realised that in my role, I didn't have to sell anything. I now don't sell anything. I can advise you and talk through an installation and tell you what I think and explain the regulations and how they work with your installation. But I won't sell a product. That's my ethos is today. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a good approach. Did you find any particularly challenging installations that were a bit of a, a mind bender at the time? Um, looking back now, yeah. So when we get, if you get a lot of buildings on one site, Sometimes when I, I remember when I first started to go out, if I had a lot of different buildings, I used to worry a little bit um, because obviously it was a it was a big thing. And I think especially being a woman in this industry, I was questioned a lot. So I had to be very sure about what I knew when, before I opened my mouth, essentially. Mm. So I would always make sure that I would take extreme, a lot of notes. I would take a lot of photos and I would discuss it all with the director. Uh, before I made my my decision just to make sure that I was on the right path yeah so what what aspects of lots of buildings was particularly challenging because you can get a lot of sites where they've got multiple buildings where some buildings might have lightning protection systems other buildings might not and so you have to then worry about induced voltage coming from lightning going to ground that can be picked up further down the line Mm. we have it's a more complex system when we look at buildings like that it's not just like we put a surge device and it protects the entire installation. Then we've got to look at a lot of different avenues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that sounds very interesting. Um, so when you say you you kind of you've developed into the technical, I understand you're a, you're the technical director for the business now. I am. So you've you've progressed through up to that role. I have. Yeah. So I've been with the company now uh, about eight years, and I am. Um, the technical um it's got to the point now if anybody wants to know anything about regulations they come to me and that's because i've i've always had this ability since i was young i can read something and it sticks in my head and i think that's applied itself very very well to the technical role um which is why i now sit on the jpal panel uh, for the regs on surge protection it's 
that it's that sort of thing that's always helped me. Right. Okay. So are there any, you say you don't have to sell a product anymore. You kind of just talk through the, the technical aspects, but does that present its any challenges in itself in terms of the level of understanding of your clients? Yeah. So I always take the view that when you're talking to a client, you start at the absolute basics. I do not care whether you are Joe Blogs and you install one domestic house or if you are a technical specifier that has specified hundreds of thousands of buildings. I always start with the simple facts of how a storage device works. Um, I use a bathtub analogy for anyone that's ever done any of my training. And it's something that I come up with explaining it to my hairdresser of what I did for a living. And I use that analogy and it doesn't matter who I'm speaking to, I start right at the bottom. Because mm. I think there's a lot of people just assume people have knowledge. And I think that's a very, very dangerous way to go about things. Sure. I think I know where you're going with the bathtub analogy, but do you mind just uh, giving us the abridged version? Okay, so the way I explain how a surge device works is if you think of a bathtub and if you turn the taps on because and you get distracted, your kids calling you or your phone's ringing or whatnot, your bathroom doesn't flood because your overflow kicks in on your bath. A surge device does exactly the same for the consumer unit. So when the voltage goes up on the consumer unit, the surge device creates the overflow to earth to get rid of the excess voltage. So how it does that is as the voltage comes up on your board, the resistance goes down through the surge device to create an easier path to earth. When the voltage comes down, the resistance goes back up to stop that flow. So I start very, very simple with the bath and make it more electrical as they understand the concept. Yeah. So do you find you've you've got a wide range of, of clients now that you're kind of having to explain that to in terms of the, the competency you obviously always start at the basics but in terms of probably your your clients for the company then do you end up just wholesaling out to you know distributors across the country or do you actually focus in on the technical installations so we do a bit of both so we work with a range of wholesalers distributors people like that but they if they have any technical difficulties they know come straight back to me and um, it's not something that they go off and sell it and then Mavericks by themselves. If there's any installation questions, they always come back to me. Um, and I do a lot of it myself as well, especially site designs, things like that. They're more complicated. Um, mm. I'll do them myself. OK, so what uh, might be a bit of a leading one, but what's the, the most common question that you will get asked? Do you know, actually, right now, my most common question is about the, wire, the wiring diagrams that are in the regulations, about CT1, CT2. Mm -hmm. That is one of my most complicated questions, not complicated, but most common questions right now, because even people that I've spoken to that are NIC assessors seem to think that they are wiring diagrams, and I have to try and explain that they actually are internal workings of a surge device. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of my more common things right now. Um, but in general, in surge, probably a very, very common misconception is a surge device will take one surge, and having to get people around that is, is generally a big thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, obviously, with the the regs change that we've we've had, uh, I was, was going to say recently, but um, <laughs> well, yeah, well over a, a year and a bit ago now, a year and a half nearly. Um, are you finding that you obviously domestic is coming to the forefront of of this as an as an issue now? Previous to that, did was it only kind of commercial industrial applications that you tended to deal with? No, so we've always had a wide range. Um, massive range of customer base. Yes, domestic has improved, it's increased a lot um, in the last sort of 18 months. But even before that, we did have domestic customers. We had customers that installed them in consumer unit. Um, we've also historically done a lot of work with panel builders, so it's before it goes into site, things like that. But there's always been a massive range. Um, we've just found it's more mainstream now, so contractors will ask us about it. When I go to e-lex shows, people want to speak to me, they want to ask questions. It's not just a Oh, you don't need that in most installations or you know what I mean it's it's more of a conversation and you know. okay yeah no I, I think the first time I saw yourself was at a lecture in January and you were doing a bit of a presentation with um, John and Paul from E5 um, so you know I can vouch that it was a very good presentation <laughs> <laughs> um, so are you finding those events are being utilized more for you know, uh, continuous professional development opportunities for uh, electricians, or are you finding it a better sales opportunity? So, so we don't sell at the event at all. Um, right. We never have. It's something we, we just don't do in general. 
it's for us it's an education thing i at the end of the day yes ideally you'd buy our search devices but my i see my role and my job as a technical expert in this industry it's a very small little industry search protection um i'm there to educate you on search protection if you want to then go and buy somebody else's that's absolutely fine but get the basics right understand what you're doing with it because i feel there's a massive gap with most a lot of manufacturers are selling the product they don't understand the ins and outs of search protection quite often it's just a badged product it's not even something they they do in depth um and i think there's a massive education hole there so my my job and the company has always taken the view that education is the key to the whole thing yeah and no, i definitely i'd agree with that it's a good ethos and i think it creates like like a brand trust doesn't it um in the end that people become familiar with yourself and you you almost become the, the, the face of uh, your your product that's it i think people buy from people um and that sounds very salesy from a non-sales person <laughs> um yeah if you, you build up the trust with somebody if you you trust somebody about a project that's what you're going to go back to every time yeah yeah no I, mean, I, I can vouch for that coming from like a, a control panel manufacturer background it was always we had the exact same products in every panel and obviously there are other benefits to that but it's what you become familiar with is what you're you you becomes your bread and butter and you know exactly what's going to go wrong even when someone's ringing you up on the phone you know you know you can diagnose it and i'm sure probably with yours if somebody's ringing up with a particular technical issue you'll know exactly what what it is and how to solve it yeah i say i can deal with probably 99 percent of queries over the phone or email um there's still the odd occasion that I go out on site, obviously not at the moment. And I've been doing my first ever video site visits. Um, yeah. Contracts to be sort of showing me around. Um, but I, I still will. If, I, if ever, I'm if i ever in doubt, I don't care. I mean, I'm based around sort of the Manchester region um, for our office. But I don't care if I have to be in Essex or in Scotland. If, if I'm in doubt, I will come and have a look at that installation myself. Yeah. You, meant, you mentioned, obviously, about um being being a woman in the industry did you find that particularly challenging at first then yeah i think to begin with i found it really strange because in the general scheme of things outside of our industry the world's moved on um it's quite normal to see women in different jobs and things like that but i think the electrical industry sometimes is a little bit behind that i mean i'm mm. glad there's a lot more female barkies out there now i'm seeing a lot more women in the industry but it's just one of them things that i think the electrical industry has been a little bit slow about and for a very long time even now in fact i will sometimes answer the phone when they ring and they presume i'm a receptionist yeah, yeah that's not great <laughs> <laughs> can't really vouch for that sort of Assum- assumptions being made particularly in you know the modern world yeah i remember the worst call i ever answered um the worst in terms of being a woman was a gentleman who said at this point i had just been put on the jcal committee i'm, I'm I understand what I'm talking about, ins and outs of surge protection. And he said to me, I, he answered, I said, how can I help? And he said, oh, he said, love, is there anybody else in? This might be a bit technical for you. I'm thinking, okay, right, let it go. He went, I said, no, I said, I should be able to help. I'm, I am technical. And he said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll explain it to you. And if you don't understand, you can pass me on to somebody else. And I just thought, you know what, I, I can't deal with that. Did you did you read him the riot act and, and turn him inside out? I did inform him that I was a part of the wiring regulation committee um, and there was actually nobody else in the building that would be better qualified to answer his question. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Hopefully um, he's learned a, le- a valuable lesson. Probably something we was going to come on to, but you mentioned that you're part of the, the, the wiring regs committee. Um, how, how did that come about? To be completely truthful, I don't know how many people that are on the Wyoming Race Committee that are going to listen to this, and I don't know how much trouble I'll get into. Um, but I found there's a massive disconnect between the electrical industry and the wiring regs. Um, and I thought, if I can help that in any way, even in my own little section, obviously 443 is only a tiny little section, but if I can help even in my own little way, then I wanted to do that. Right, okay. So how, how did that kind of come about? We, Obviously, I know they're very select in, in who they allow to be to be members. Did you find you had to kind of uh, professionally uh, develop, get some recognition for, for your work prior to that? I've just not not so much recognition, but I've always worked with very closely with lots of different organisations. So I've always worked quite closely with NAPIT. I've done a lot mm-hmm. of work with 
know, I've sat on their technical board for a long time. I've, I've answered a lot of questions for them. I've done a lot of road shows with them, that sort of thing. Um, and they just put me in touch with the right people. Obviously, they're heavily involved with the Wild and Rigs Committee anyway. Um, so I spoke to some people at the British Standards Industry Institute and um, I had to do an interview with them. And they found that I was technically competent enough to be involved. So. Okay, yeah, that's, that's superb. Are there are there quite a few women on on the um, the committee? No, no, there is not. I am the only woman on my panel. I've never met another woman to do with the the Wyoming Regulations Committee. No. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm sure, the first day I ever turned up, most of them thought I was there to bring them coffee. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So if there if there is anyone listening, maybe that's something that should be changed. <laughs> I think it should. But the thing is, I'm not saying that is a sexist thing from being no women on the wine committee. Um, I think by the year 2020, this, there should be more. But there's not many women in them sort of technical roles. So I don't think it's something we can change at that level, the wiring legs just yet. But it's something we can change at the lower levels in, in the electrical industry. We can start bringing women into more technical roles, things like that. Yeah, I think you probably hit the nail on the head. If, if you have a, a wider pool to actually start from, people will naturally filter to the top in the same way that you, yourself has. And the more opportunity there are for, for women in the industry, the more likely you are to have someone who technically excels and, and move into those roles. So I think, like you say, I think we're hopefully seeing a, a trend change um certainly i think from my experiences i am um and i, I don't i think it still has to be based on merit and technical competence yeah. but I, but i think the as long as the opportunities and things for discussion can still start being there then yeah i think the industry can move forward for the better yeah definitely i'm not i'm not someone that's out there waving a flag saying women should all be in these roles but there definitely shouldn't be the lack of women that there are um, but as I said, I don't feel that's been a, possibly not an active choice that's been made. And um, I may be wrong, that may have been a choice. Um, but it, it does need to improve, definitely. Sure. So you obviously mentioned about doing a LEX show. Obviously, we've heard the uh, the podcast with E5, the webinars you've been doing. You know, I'm sure I think there's been quite a good uptake on those, hasn't there, recently? Yeah, I think I've trained about 300 people since the end of April online. So I wow. Think Relatively well, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, re- that's really good. I don't really know how to use be doing a webinar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Learn on the job. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's probably like everyone with, with Skype and everything at the moment. It's um, learn as you go and talk while you're muted. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, so in terms of educating the electrical industry, then where, where do you see it going in, in the future? I think people are getting much more used to the fact they've got to continue educating rather than, I think, the mindset has always been, oh, God, we're getting new regs. Oh, we've got to pay for another course. We've got to buy another book. You know what I mean? Um, I think people are being a lot more aware that they've got to do this now. It's not just about new regulations coming through. We've got new technologies that are coming out all the time. Um, and people are much more aware that that's something they've got to carry on doing. Although I do think, that curriculums for apprentices, things like that, do need to change. Um, I've done some work with some colleges where I've done some training for their apprentices on surge protection because surge protection still isn't on the curriculum. Mm. Yet it's a part of the 18th edition. I can't understand how a contra- a, an, an apprentice can leave things like that without having knowledge of the 18th edition regulations. Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely uh, agree with that. I think there was so much scope gap, even when I left, uh, I think it was the 17th had only just come in when, when I finished mine. And yeah, you, d- you don't know very much at all apart from what you've done on in your day job, really. Exactly, exactly. I think that's the thing with the industry, you sort of pigeonhole, don't you? you? You sort of start your day job and the stuff you're doing day in, day out, you might understand completely um, everything about but there still be other bits that you don't maybe understand that education is such a big part of. So it, it's such a massive thing in the electrical industry is the education. Mm. I think some people are a little bit frightened of that. Yeah, I, th- I think I've, I've heard, uh, I'm going to quote Paul Meenan here, and I know he's sp- spoke about potentially splitting up the 
the regs into two sections, you know, having your fundamental principles and then you've got all the special locations as, as a separate element. I think that's probably a, a very good idea. Um, yeah, I think people get very, very hung up on these special locations in the other bits and they forget the fundamental principles. Yeah. And we've got to remember that's, that's the safety aspects of most of the work we're doing is our fundamental principles. Yeah, exactly. Go Always go back to the fundamentals. <laughs> um, so what's one of the things you most enjoy about the industry that, during your time? The diversity, actually. Um, I pardon, love... pardon the pun. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I can be speaking to somebody one day that's installing their first ever service device for a domestic install. The next moment I can be speaking to somebody that's a veteran installing surge protection, they've always done it, and they're working on a new installation where they don't quite understand it. I can be working on with a telecoms company where they don't know anything about surge protection at all, but they know they need it for their kit. Or I might be dealing with somebody that's dealt with another supplier that they haven't explained things the way they understand. I feel like the electrical industry, especially in my role, I deal with such a varied amount of people, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Mm. No, that's, that's, that's awesome. Do you, what's the thing you dislike the most then? Um, I can't say the language because I feel like I will upset a lot of electricians. <laughs> 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 um, assumptions. I think assumptions drive me a little bit crazy. Um, I think I, I am a young woman. I'm still a woman in my twenties. Um, and I do get that assumption that I can't quite possibly know what I'm talking about. Right. And I think the electrical industry needs to have their minds open, a little bit more open about the fact that there are different people in the industry. Yeah, hopefully as the younger generations come through and I think more on, on social media, I am seeing a lot more young women enter into electrical apprentices, apprenticeships, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, I can see the tide changing. So hopefully that, that does, those assumptions start to move away. That's it. But then... Uh, I've got to say, I think I love that aspect at the same time, as well as it being something that annoys me and it does great on me. I also love the challenge of it. Mm. I love walking into a room and somebody say, thinking, or even some of them have said, that there's not a way I possibly know what I'm talking about and can educate them, and then walk out completely dumbfounded. That, that for me, is part of the challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. The shock and awe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Underestimation, it's a powerful tool. <laughs> yeah. So where do you um, see yourself going next? Um, I will always be at this company. I love it. I love what I do. Um, I'll always be in surge protection. I think personally, uh, my next, I'd like to look at becoming a chartered engineer. I'd like to become a CNG. But there is so much work that has to go into that, um, putting together portfolios, things like that, that's going to take me a while. Um I'm actually 30 this year, so my plan is before I'm 40 to be chartered um, and to be a fellow. I'd like to be a fellow of the IET before I'm 40. Um, other than that, I'm just going to keep working, keep educating, keep doing what I'm doing. That's brilliant. So where, where do you think surge protection could be going? Um, in terms of regulation and surge protection as a whole, I think it's becoming more and more the norm. Um, I think... In the next sort of 10 years, surge protection will just be installed on every job as standard, the same as we use RCDs and things like that. I think it's just going to become a standard device that we use. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Have you have you seen much call up for um, uh, Type 3 devices? Yeah, there's definitely been an increase, um, especially for things like fire alarm systems. Mm. The, we've got that regulation um, in 443 where if it's a risk to life or injury, um, and fire alarm systems obviously can be a big part of that. So, and they can be particularly sensitive now as well with the electronics in there. So quite a lot of people are installing Type 3s and like fuse burst feeding fire alarms, things like that. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, think, I don't think I have any anything more to ask. <laughs> yeah, I'm honest. I think it's been a it's been a fa- fascinating conversation to be honest. Um, it's, it's flown by. Um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? I'd like to give a bit of a plug for the E5 guys, to be honest. Um, I know you've done you've done a bit of work with them. I just think they're fantastic. I love the change they're trying to bring in the industry. I love that education's at the centre of everything they want to do. Um, I'd love to be a member of E5. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm like an honorary 
on an honorary side to E5. Um, I love them completely. I think they're fantastic guys. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll second that. <laughs> it's been a great conversation. I do have one last question for you, though. What's your favourite movie? Die Hard. That is a great choice. <laughs> <laughs> is it a Christmas movie? No, it is not. It is a movie for every day, not just Christmas. Day. <laughs> Brilliant. We'll end on that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time, Kirsty. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for listening.